January 2007. Rick Waitman, it's great to speak to you as ever. He lied. Oh, <laughs> No, I know. It's always I've good to see I've had the money. It. The check didn't bounce. <laughs> No, seriously, 2007 was, there's another really nice project, and I guess like a lot of artists, you've you sort of been rooting in, in the cupboards for various yep. uh, old shows and, and things like that. You've done a very successful bootleg box called The Treasure Chest, which mm. was, was, came out a few years ago. Now we're looking towards the film side of things. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose... That's not me, by the way, that's the... Uh, I, I, I suppose it's... Um, it's down to the, I, I, I'm not one who looks back very much, I'll be very honest. I used to, I used to look back a lot, but I suppose things in your life, not just musical, but you know, marriage-wise, divorce-wise, also, it's, you think, hold on, if I keep looking back, I'm not gonna get anywhere. And I, and I, my father used to say to me that it's your past that shapes your present, and it's your present that shapes your future. Uh, so you can look back to your past and use the best bits. Uh, use the best bits for moving forward, and I suppose um, there are uh, there are some things visually on TV programs, things I did over the years that are, I suppose, they're stepping stones into how I got to where I am today. And in a strange way, uh, the stepping stones will continue to whatever I do in the future. Um, and up until recently, with because of technology and because of contractual problems and all sorts of things. Um, they've been lost, they've been left in covers, same as they have for many artists and whatever. And in the same way with Treasure Chest, that I found stuff that uh, I think was very pertinent to how I got to where I am t today. Um, the, the same thing has now happened you know, visually with, with programmes and things that have suddenly started, started to appear. Um, I know there's a lot of stuff out there, for, for, you know, for example, the TVs I did over the years, not just in the UK, but in different countries, when uh, and there's other stuff around as well. For example, I know in Italy, um, Turin used to be literally the, the capital of prog rock back in the, in the uh, early 70s. And every band used to go out to Italy and go to, uh, go to Turin to do a program. There was a couple of places in Sweden we always used to go to. Um, even up recently there was a, uh, a, another program in Italy, uh, in Bologna, that, that used to run. You know, you used to go and play live. Unbelievable. I mean, you couldn't do it in the UK back then in the 70s, but you could actually take your band out, all your gear out, and you'd play live. And so these shows were a lot different to a lot of the ones that appeared in the UK and in America. And I always thought they were lost. Um, in fact, many of them, because they were done on the big old two-inch tape, were destroyed. Um, but they, a lot of them have been saved very much by, I suppose, fans is the wrong word, but shall we say people who actually care a little bit. Yeah. Um, the, the TV companies used to work very much, I know after 10 years, it was either eight years or 10 years, the rule was if the, the tape hadn't been, uh, if, if the program hadn't been shown again, then the tapes were erased and yeah. the tapes were reused again. That was pretty much the golden rule. But I know for a fact that uh, in, the, in the rooms where the tapes were erased, ready to be gone, yeah. If you had somebody in the room who liked rock or who liked comedy or whatever, and an Eric Sykes program came up, <laughs> Sykes, whatever, you think, oh, I can't, I can't. then it would be slipped to one side because nobody would ever know yeah. that it didn't appear on the pile. And I, the reason I know a lot of this is there, there was a young lady I was very friend, friendly with um, who, like me, loved Dad's Army and loved other, and she worked in BBC archives. And uh, one of the top tricks they used to do was if something came in to be erased and was going to be checked afterwards by the hierarchy, um, they would put it down as damaged tape. Right. Uh, and therefore skipped. The tape would then be couriered either to Bristol or to Manchester, <laughs> where it would go in the just in the Manchester archives office, where you know, they had reciprocal agreements where stuff would be stored. And then the same thing would happen when it got to the stage where it was going to be, um, you know, erased again. So it's it just was just moved around. It was just moved around <laughs> to avoid it being done, but it would appear that it, it no longer existed. And that's how I got hold of one or two of my programs. Now, the, both the King Arthur program uh, and, and one of the other programs uh, uh, that Sabib did were down as being erased uh, in 1987, I think they mm -hmm. were disappeared, no longer existed. Um, 
uh, the omnibus programme was down as, as having disappeared in 1992, but I know it exists. There's a lot of stuff that I know is, is still around. And in the same way, the BBC, when they were missing stuff, like they were missing a lot of the Hancocks, they were missing a lot of things, they declared an amnesty. There is amazing stuff out there. I mm. mean, I, I used to, in the early days of video, for example, I used to collect comedy. I loved comedy. I lived in Switzerland and I just collected lots of comedy stuff. Um, and you couldn't buy it. There was no shops then. And that's how I, I met the, this, this lady who worked in BBC Archives. Um, and another guy down at Ealing Studios. I said, it's a great shame that the, the early Hancocks were all missing. And there was a bit of a silence. <laughs> and, and I had to, it was really, it was almost like cloak and dagger stuff. I had to meet them at, on Ealing Common, <laughs> these two. And it was really was the brown paper bag job. Oh dear. Uh, and, a, a, you know, and a little brown paper, brown envelope going by because they'd had to do it in the early hours yeah. when there was nobody and bribe the, you know, the, <laughs> security people, all that sort of thing. And for many years, my pride and joy, when people came round, I could show them the blood donor, which people thought was missing. Yeah. I, I had the original pilot of Dad's Army. And this is my pride and joy. I could put, now everybody's got them because you can buy them in the BBC. Yeah. Okay. But uh, the same thing, there's a lot of music out there for a lot of artists, especially artists that were around a lot in, in, the, in the early 70s and mid, late 70s. There's a lot of stuff at TV stations uh, where bands played live, and I'm sure a lot of it's going to get unearthed. The amazing thing is, if you think about this, I mean, per, from you, your point of view personally, this is really part of Britain's musical heritage, and it's been treated so dreadfully. I mean, this subterfuge that where you had to move these tapes around, like, like I mean, well, it's, it's nobody almost cares. like a farce. It's because nobody cares because the people who run who run the music industry don't care. Yeah. Uh, they used to care. Back in the 60s and the certainly most of the 70s, the music business was run by people who cared. Yeah. Um, when that, that decade went into the 80s, it was run by well, the accountants. Corporate, the corporate decade. Yeah, yeah the corporate decade yeah. and accountants. Mm. It was run by the bottom line. It wasn't run by people. I, I, I mean, Armour Erskine, who died just recently, Armour was a music man. Yeah. He just loved music. Okay, he was the boss of Atlantic Records, but for, foremost than anything else, he loved music. Jerry Moss, who owned a and loved music. Uh, what happened to a and It was bought by distillers initially before it went on to become part of Universal. Now nobody even knows what they've got. Yeah. There's nobody there anymore who cares about music. Uh, and the whole, in that, that's, that's changed. And the heritage that comes from the 60s and 70s, music-wise, especially British heritage, is huge and really I think it's it needs to be sort of you know looked after we you know I'm not talking about crap things like Rock and Roll Hall of Fame which I think are a joke anyway I, I the, this stuff should be archived it should be kept it should be um, in universities music colleges it should mm -hmm. be there for people to pick off and, and find out what's going on there's gonna be people in a hundred years time who are gonna ask about Barclay James Harvest or or Hawkwind or Yes or Zeppelin or mm -hmm. um, okay some of the bigger bands they'll be able to pick certain stuff off off the shelf but they're not gonna not gonna be able to get a real definitive idea of what these bands went through and what they did and where they played and, and, and it's, it's funny actually you should say that because recently um, I saw a copy of a program that you made not long after you joined Yes called Sounding Out and that suddenly oh, surfaced on the trading. Has lists. It? Yes, it has. Well, I remember doing that. So that, but I remember seeing that when that was first on the TV, and that's so things. You're right. Things are starting to surface, and there, and more stuff will start. I mean, the BBC. I mean, at least they put the, a lot of the whistle test together. It, a lot of this music, if it's hung around now for 20, 30 years, forty years, it people are going to be playing it. If young people, teenagers, and in their twenties are playing stuff from the sixties and seventies now then it's going to be a fact of life that people in 50, 60 years' time from now are going to be playing some of that stuff. Mm, yeah. uh, and they're going to be asking questions about it. And if either the visuals or the audio or the interviews are not there for people to, you know, to look up and, and research if they want to, I mean, where, where, they're just going to be going, who the hell was this? Do you think a lot of this, though, has been fan-motivated? Because, as you said, the record companies, aside from some specialist companies, yeah. like, for the sake of argument, voice print, 
Um, there's you, an awful lot of it's been saved thanks to the fans. I thoroughly agree with you. A lot of fans have done some fantastic. The, the only minor problem with that is that it, it it can slightly get a bit warped as to what has value and what doesn't have, yes. have, have, have value. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're dead right about the record. I, mean, I don't care. They're big conglomerates now. Uh, they've fallen into the uh, um, what I call the Pan Am syndrome. You know, back in the 70s, 80s when there was. Uh, Pan Am, TWA, you know, all the big airline, they, oh, we're too big, nobody can touch us. And of course they've all gone. They've all gone. Uh, you know, if you look at a picture of an airport from 1975 and a picture of an airport now, you won't see one name that you recognise. They've no. all gone. And it's happened. If you look at all the great names in, in record companies, they've all gone. They've all virtually well, disappeared. Well, they're all part of a, a, yeah. a big umbrella you know, group and, now. And they've, they? all, they've, all, they've all gone. You know, um, and, it, and it's nuts, really, because of the identity that these... these labels all, all had and and I th I've always argued as well vehemently that one of the reasons that the, the record industry is in such a bad state and don't let anybody tell you that it's not in in a bad state because it is I mean you know to get a number one album back in 1975 you had to sell considerably more albums than you have to do today yeah. and when you consider the populations doubled and the buying populations doubled you know somebody should be scratching their head and going I think we're doing something wrong here we actually should be selling twice as much yeah. but we're not um but i put a lot of that down to the fact that when the record company started well when band started and, and, and the big i suppose the big boom came in the uh, uh 70s of albums uh there weren't any 50 or 60 year old rock and rollers around everybody was 20 25 30 or late teens and uh, and so nobody had anything to look forward to what was going to happen when these people hit 50, 60, 70 years old. Yeah. And as, as things changed, as music changed, every decade some new fads and things came in, new executives came into the record companies and they changed shape. And nobody knew what to do with these people who were getting older. And you suddenly got to a situation like today where you've got a lot of people who, musicians who are 50, 60, whatever, and the average record company exec, you know, still in nappies, and they ain't got a clue. They wouldn't know how to deal with them. And I've always used the analogy, or thought of the analogy, that uh, what the PGA Golf did, which was really, really clever. They realised that the guys, the, the, you know, there were some great, great names, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, Gary Player, all these guys were no longer perhaps fit enough to to play the big tour and things all the time. They'd reached 50 plus and they couldn't play the big tours anymore because they couldn't, they, but they still could play and still could do it. And the young people who were running the PGA didn't know quite how to deal with them. Would you still got all these massive big names? What'd you do? So they started the seniors tour. They started the seniors PGA run by people who knew how they were with sponsors like Cadillac, which is their, yeah. their people. And, and, and playing three-day events, not four-day events. And what do they find? More people go to those events than they do to the standard PGA. And it's all part of the same group, but it's run by people who understand the market, who understand how they work, that know that these guys still have so much to offer and so much to do. Uh, and why the record industry don't do that? Why, for example, somebody like Sonny doesn't say, Call it whatever you like. We'll have the senior rock division. We'll put people who understand how these things, who can put it with the right sponsors, the right people, the right concerts. You know, I, I, I was in America with, yes, we, were, we, we had two days at Madison Square Garden. And prior to us going in, The Who were doing five days there. It was the, uh, the, the tour where, where, sadly, John Emerson had died yeah. just before the tour. And I was speaking to a record exec. It was so funny. I met, I met him at a bash that we'd all been invited to, but none of us really wanted to go. And he was telling me about this this great band who came to nothing, young kids, um, who they were spending a fortune on and they were doing a showcase at the, at the, at the bottom line and all this sort of thing. And, uh, and, I, and I, was, I sort of said to him, you know, so hey, how much are you spending? They were spending a fortune on this band. And I said, right. I said, I said will they sell any, anything? He said, it, well, we're, we're hoping to break them here. This is our fourth attempt, whatever. I went, right. And I was speaking to Pete, Pete <laughs> Townsend. I said, you know what, Sir Joe? 
We've sold out two nights at Madison Square Garden. That's 44,000. You've done five nights. That's 100 and whatever, 110,000 people. I said, you got current record contracts? No. Nah. I said, do any of the old record company execs come? No. Nah. So they come to you? No. No, they're not, never seen anybody. Not for years and years. Now you'd think that they would cotton on that these bands can still go out, you know, pull in, shell, but all they can think of is, oh, we'll make a, 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 um, a telly sales album. That, that's what we'll do, we'll do a telly sales album. You know, and I just look and I think this is so, so wrong. I just think that, I just think it, it's all balls up, and I think that it's that, that there's so much being lost, in, you know, in every single respect. And I think that anything that can come out, um, there's a huge parallel when you watch some of the programmes that appear from other countries where we went over and played live, either as Yes or my own band or whatever, because you watch the, a lot of the young bands today, some of the good ones who can play a bit. And it actually looks exactly the same. They're, going, they're exactly at the same stage in their careers mm -hmm. that we were back then. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they're looking as to what's happened to a lot of the guys in their 50s and yeah. 60s and go, shit, that's going to happen to us. Yeah. Is anybody actually going to care? I mean, the only people who really care are the diehards and fans, as you know, uh, and, uh, and the musicians themselves. We just carry on and go, sod it, you know, because the, the infrastructure is no longer there. And it needs to be put into place if we're going to hold on to the fantastic British rock heritage that we have. This video archive that yeah. really you, you're going to tap into initially, we yeah. hope to be four particular shows in this, the first part of it. Mm. How, do you, how do you see that as being seen? I mean, here you are, you're, you're, your solo career is over 30 years old now. I mean, it's... You, 40 nearly, yeah. Well, is it in terms of releasing oh, six, really, six right. wives, it's, yeah, it's, what was that, 72, 72 January 72, yeah. yeah, you're right. So, it's, so here you are, 30 odd years down the road, Yeah. Um, you still have a very hardcore loyal audience as a solo artist, obviously there yeah. are people who see you with yes and will come and see you yeah. as well. As regards this particular package, what are your hopes for something like this? I mean, obviously you want it out there and it, you, at least you've got something hard copy in your hand there then, haven't you? Which I think is a big thing for the audience that go to your concerts. And, I mean, mm. I'm part of that. I don't want to download. I want a box. I want yeah, something I to read. Absolutely. You know. Yeah, and I think that's still very, very prevalent. And, and that just sidetracking fractionally has shown an awful lot with now the number of kids who are raiding every junk shop and antique shop possible to buy the old Dan set majors and the hi fi. Yeah. I, I've got a, a, my youngest boy who's 21 now. He's at. Um, just going for 21, he's at Southampton University. And he was in halls for the first year. And every bloody student in the room, you open the door, there was a dance at major or a high fidelity for them. They've all got them. And they're yeah. all buying the, the album because they want the info, they want the thing. Tangibly to hold things now yeah. and see it, you know. And you're dead right on that front. Um, what do I want out of it? The truth is, it's really strange. I'm 58 this year and I'm still looking f forward to lots of things that I want to do and I'm still aiming to do lots of new things and you know, because that's what drives you on. But things like the video archive, that's my life. Mm. That's my life that when you did it, it was a one-off. It was a one-off. You went over it, you played, probably went out and got this, got on the plane and came home again. <laughs> and, and that was it. It never occurred to you at the time that some stage in the future you would look back and go, God, that was my life. Yeah, but you're like so many people who created something in the 60s, 70s and 80s. You would not probably see that as the way you just described it because you were no. too busy living your life and on to the true. next thing. It's only in hindsight, which of course, mm. great. hindsight's crazy, isn't it? I mean, we oh, yeah. all had hindsight. We'd all have six numbers every Saturday on the lottery. That's true. But I mean, in, in, in essence, really, it is something that you've probably grown to appreciate more as you've got older then. Uh, I think there's an element of truth in that. And there's also a very strange thing as well. When I look at the programmes, I recognise all the guys in the band, <laughs> but I don't recognise me. 
<laughs> it's really bizarre. And when I speak to some of the guys in the band, like Ashley, who was around at the time, and Tony Fernandez and a few of the other guys, were, they say the same thing. It's really weird. They can look at everybody and go, oh, right, yeah, I remember you doing that. I remember that, that, that. And but they look at themselves and go, that's not me. It's really <laughs> bizarre. I don't see, I don't see me. And I, I, it's, I don't, there's probably some psychologist who would have a field day with I'm that sure one. sure there is. But uh, it's, it's very bizarre. I look at it and I go, wow. And sometimes I can remember doing the programme. You know, I saw some film footage from Brazil recently uh, that I did way back in 75. I just looked at it and shook my head. Because I could, I could actually remember, it brought back memories of doing it, but I go, but that's not me. First of all, I was <laughs> half the weight. You know, <laughs> but it's just, it's so bizarre because that really is a time warp. Yeah. And I suppose that's the amazing thing about film footage and, and also about the original stuff on vinyl and the original stuff on the old, you know, uh, you know, video, the original videotape that was done for, for TV. It has, it's wrapped in a certain period of time. Yeah. And you can't, you know, you can't enhance it. You can and change it, but, oh, but, but it, it is doesn't what work. It is. it is what it is. Yeah. It's, it's like, why is it that you can actually colorize black and white films? They never look right. No, they don't. You're right, absolutely. It never, ever looks right. And, and I think that's the same, but I look at these, I suppose I look at some of this, I go, that's a time warp. And I suppose the thing that's interesting for me is that it is, it's, it's a bit like a diary. You know, you can go back in, I never, I've never kept a diary, but I know people who have, and they say they'll go back to, uh, I mean, Bill Wyman is a classic example. Yeah. He, he can go back with some of the stuff he's got, and Bill's stuff is fantastic. And, and I know Bill says, I, I look at that date, such and such, and, and he can go back to that date. And I think when you've got stuff like that, you can actually go back to that time. And also, there's an awful lot of people. I mean, I'm so lucky with real wonderful, hardcore people who like the music. And a lot of them weren't born when I did some of this. Well, that, that's something I was just about to come to. I mean, this video vault will fulfill two criteria, really. Mm. You've got the original fans who remember it, and want to have it as a memento and just yeah. something, a reminder. And then you've got the newer fans who weren't lucky enough to actually capture that, who can yeah. actually see it now. So it's a kind of win-win situation, really. I mean, if you, if you didn't like it then, you're not going to like it, it now. No, that's very so, true. So, I mean, but for the fans who, who, who like your music, this is a win-win situation in, in many ways. It is. I'll tell you something else that's weird. Uh, a young guy came out and he had, a, um, he, had a, he had some vinyl albums and some CDs. And he had the six wives and journey and a couple of other things. And I signed I said, how old are you? And he said, well, we're 19. And yeah. I said, God, I said, you, uh, I said, your parents probably weren't born when I did this, <laughs> let alone, let alone you. I said, and I said, what do you like about this old stuff? And he was very, he said, well, it's new to me. <laughs> I suppose if he's only just heard it, and it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. And it suddenly occurred to me, yeah, yeah forget a date. If you hear, if they discover a piece of Beethoven that's never been discovered, and they play. It's new. It's new. So to somebody, the music will always be new. Right. And that's another thing that I thought the record companies fail to realise, that uh, a lot of the music, whether it's... Uh, somebody somewhere today will be listening to Deep Purple for the first time. Yeah, I guess that's they'll true. Be, or the they'll Beatles, be even. For the first time. Yeah. yeah and, and, that's, and that's something that I think that... Um, because record companies have got so engrossed in the word fashion that they have failed to realise that it's, it's not just archive they're keeping, it's something that's new for somebody else. Well, you, you touched on something really a minute ago when you said, I look at these things, I recognise all the guys in the band, but I don't recognise myself. Mm. What, I, what I love about this, because having grown up through that period, obviously yeah. I've gone to the concerts, and I'm... And, my girlfriend and her kids look at it <coughs> and they say, oh, state of the clothes. And yeah, everybody wore those though. So mm. you might think it looks silly now. And if I walked around dressed like that now, I would probably be arrested. But <laughs> as everybody walked around looking like that, it, it was, it's funny. And that is the thing. It is what it is. It's very much of the time. But that doesn't mean to say that it isn't entertaining. No. I mean, an old film can be entertaining. An old piece of music can be entertaining. Because mm. as you've just said, if somebody's viewing it for the first time, it's new to them. It's also, you know, it's, it's period too. It's now become period music. 
in, in a strange way. So you've got period drama, and period, yeah. you know, it, it, it has become period. And there will undoubtedly, in the same way that there are bands that have cloned themselves on 70s stuff, that wear all the 70s clothes, they'll be doing that in years to come. You know, it's a fact of life. But you're, you're dead right. I mean, what we did back then, um, I, <laughs> I mean, I think the thing about that particular era was it was very individual. I mean, you could actually pretty much get away with wearing anything you wanted. You could be as com completely nutty as you wanted. And, and uh, well, I have to say, I mean, you, it, really. you were not known for your restraint <laughs> in any no. way, neither musically, fashion-wise, or any other way. No, that's true. I mean, that's there, it was man. it was a, a, a period of excess for many people. Yeah. But if you look at the the performance, the performance still stands up. I mean, I was looking at the King Arthur, which, funny enough, there's in this month's in one of the magazines that I read. Mm. There's a, there's a nice article. It's under the Rock Follies. In mm. essence, it really was a a folly, but then a concept album about King Henry VIII, the Six Wives, could be conceived as yeah. being a folly. The funny thing about you King know. Arthur was um, the, uh, the 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 music press reviewed it before it happened, which was quite funny. <laughs> they just actually slated it, the idea of the whole thing, before it even happened. Yeah. Uh, luckily, we'd sold out three nights at Wembley. And we never sent out one press ticket. One press ticket. And about two, three days before the opening night, uh, I and M, a chap called Tony Burfield, was inundated from music press. Well, we need five, two, we need ten. We haven't received any tickets. And Tony said, "Well, um, you will hate it." Yeah. Why do you want to go? Why do you want to go? Yeah. What, what's the point <laughs> of you going? You've already pre-reviewed it. Luckily, general public don't agree with you because they, they. Sold out three nights. So, but uh, but why do you want to come? You've already slagged it off. Well, 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 well. Uh, oh, they're missing and out, hundreds and hundreds, hundreds. <laughs> and we never gave one press ticket. <laughs> Musically, it was good. The orchestra were great. The choir were great. I know, but come on, be fair. I'm going to do this. It's going to be great. It's con. It's a concept, and we're going to do it on ice. Yeah, but that was accident. That was, an, <laughs> that was a complete accident. <laughs> it really was. Uh, uh, I wanted to do it at Wembley. I wanted to do Wembley at the Empire Pool as it used to be called then. That's where I wanted to do it. And I went to my manager's office at the time, who was a guy called Brian Lane, and there was Harvey Goldsmith, or Harvey Goldmine, as we used to love him call him. <laughs> and we were sitting there, and I said, I want to do the King Arthur. Uh, and I said, I want to do it at Wembley. And I'm not sure why, but Harvey I said, no, I would do it at the Albert Hall. I said, I don't want to do it at the Albert Hall. That's the wrong venue. I, I, yeah. it, I want to do it at Wembley and Empire now, he said, and I said, I want to do it in the round. I want to do it, you know, like, you know, yes, I'd already done shows in the, in the, in yeah. the round. Um, and I said, uh, oh, no, yes, I hadn't done a show in the round then. Um, so I want to do it in the round, in, in the middle. Um, of, of, so it's, you know, with the orchestra and everything, so that it can yeah. be seen from all, all yeah. sides. People looking down at it. You can't do it. Uh, yes, I can. No, you can't. Uh, I can remember either going, no, 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 you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we'll do it at the Albert Hall. And I said, give me one good reason why I can't do it in whatever the month was. In, in July. July. Yeah. And they said, well, because the ice follies. Are and I said, what do you mean the ice follies? Well, the ice follies are coming in in August to do their summer show. Actually, in July, the, uh, it, it'll be ice. I said, no, fuck. <laughs> I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. So I came out then. I was really pissed off because it, this was, you know, I thought, I don't know, somewhere along the line, Brian and Harvey have got that date booked, or those dates booked at the Albert Hall. That's why they're doing it. That's why they want me to do it at the Albert Hall. They didn't want to talk about anywhere else but the bloody Albert Hall. So <laughs> I, um, I got, I walked down to Notting Hill Gates um, railway station, um, district line, and I got on the train. I was going to go back to where was I living? And out in Buckinghamshire. And I thought, no, and I ended up. I remember having this grin on my face. And I got on the train, Central Island, went up to, uh, changed at where I was, and I ended up at Fleet Street. And I got off these, I mean, obviously no mobile phones and things like that. No. And I went to a phone box, and I phoned up Chris Welch at Melody Maker. And I said, Chris, do you fancy uh, a drink in the Red Lion, which was in Red Lion Square, just off Fleet Street? And he said, uh, oh, yes, yes, Rick. And I said, might have a story for you. He said, Oh, great, yes, lovely. 
So we met in Red Line. And I can remember sitting in Red Line Square, in the pub, sitting there. He went, what, what's this? I said, I'm going to do uh, three live shows of uh, King Arthur. You know, he went, oh, yeah, great. He said, we had heard a rumour that that was, that was going to happen. I said, yeah. He said, where are you going to do it? I said, Wembley. He said, oh, all right. I said, all right. He said, uh, you got some dates? I said, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be July. And, uh, and I said, it's going to be a little bit different too. That's right. I said, what is it? I said, on ice. Now, this is way before days of tour video, wasn't it? Right. He went, what? I said, I'm going to build a castle in the middle of the ice ring. I'm going to have skaters skating all round, depicting the various scenes of King Arthur. Build a castle in the middle with the choir and orchestra and the band and have people skating round um, and doing all the uh, depicting of the various scenes. Yeah. He went, are you serious? And I said, yeah. He went, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Following Thursday, Melody Maker, Big Adler for that, this whole thing, uh, Arthur on Ice, the whole thing. I got a phone call from Brian May, he said, you bastard. <laughs> and I said, good idea, isn't it? Touché. And, uh, and that's how it happened. And then he said, well, how are you going to do it? There's no ice skating. And all the best, or most of the best ice skaters at that time were Australian. Yeah. So I said, I'll fly them in. I think there was a, a girl called Patricia Penny, who was the world champion at the time. I flew her in from... Australia. I, I was actually very impressed with some of the girl dancers on they the were, show. They were really, really good. But I thought their, um, I thought that their outfits were incredible. <laughs> they weren't exactly medieval. No. Not unless Janet. They were more Janet listen, Rieger than. Listen, I'm rock and roll, <laughs> mate. I'm rock. And, but the, the interesting thing, uh, I mean, ice skating wasn't even popular then. No. It wasn't, wasn't even remotely popular, and uh, the uh, the funny thing was. Um, Tony Burfield and Terry O'Neill at A&M Records, they, they said, got any idea for a PR thing? And I said, uh, yeah, they all sat down. I said, uh, yeah, they said, I said, I don't know what to do. I said, um, we we'll just put out a press release that um, it's going to be an all singing, all dancing with ice skates and things, horses. <laughs> so they put it out horses. <laughs> the moment I put out the, the word horses was printed in the old evening news. Uh, oh, God. RSPCA. Oh, I had the lot. <laughs> RSPCA. I had um, uh, Brent Council. The whole. The, they all demanded me. So we said, "Yeah, fine." And they said, okay. I said uh, do "You have oh, horses? Yeah. How many? Fifty. What?" I said, uh, I, "And they said, you can't, you can't do this.'" It's, so they all came down. A huge press call. And I got um, fifty of the guys who were playing the nights to come out with their hobby horses. <laughs> that's what they were. They were hobby horses. Yeah. And they hear they all up. Now, to their credit, with the exception of Brent Council, <laughs> who didn't find it remotely funny, everybody else. I said, well, I never said they were real. No, I true. said, horses. True. These are these are horses. These are horses. <laughs> everybody else thought it was great fun, and then and uh, the evening news gave it great spreads, and they were really really good, I have to say. And it was very very funny. I mean, uh, the whole event did generate such an amazing amount of press, not only in the music press, but it oh, crossed yeah. over to the, the national it press. It did, big time. It did. It? I mean, a lot of people said to me, I mean, it lost money. Yeah. I mean, the three shows had to lose money. There was no human way that those three shows could... I mean, it was the first time, to the best of my knowledge, that a PA was flown in there. Yeah. I bought Claire Brothers, because there wasn't a PA good enough in the UK mm -hmm. back then, and uh, 75, and I bought, I bought uh, the Claire Brothers... PA over from America, and it was it was hung. It was the first time it was hung and netted. Never been done before. Yeah. Uh, there were lots and lots and lots and lots of firsts. You know, you looked at the figures. It had to lose a fortune, and it did lose a fortune. Those three shows. And people say to me, "Well, you're nuts. You did it, and you lost all the, you know all the money." I say, "Yeah. Interestingly enough, though, the album went on to sell 12 million copies. So, would I have actually sold 12 million copies?" If I hadn't done King Arthur on Ice, and people still remember King Arthur, well, on I ice. guess it's a, a matter of speculate to accumulate in many ways. I mean, it? I didn't do it to do that. No, I mean, I, said, I did it because it was there to be done, and I wanted to do it. In, well, you um, were very much one of, the, <laughs> one of the, probably one of the very few <laughs> who, who did do that. So let's be honest. If, it was, if there was something to be overdone, you did it, but you did it so yeah, well. I like to. I like overdoing. I mean, it's there to be. See, it's and I like. I like doing entertainment and, and spectaculars are great fun, providing people play. The one thing though, everything that everybody heard was played. Yeah. 
there was no, you know, there's lots of spectacles that go on these days with various miming and tapes and computer yeah. hey, things. My golden rule was, you know, if you can't play it, you don't do it. Well, you were probably one of the first artists to actually use an orchestra, a full choir, mm. and, and put it with a rock band. I mean, it had been tried before, but not on anywhere near the scale that you actually did it on. I mean, particularly with things like Journey to the Centre of the Earth and, and obviously King, King Arthur as well. They were the two big things at that particular well, I, period. I looked at a lot of stuff that had been done. And the late um, David Meacham, sadly no longer with us, who, who was a very forward-thinking conductor with the LSO, I sat and discussed loads of things with him, loads and loads, and, and looked at lots of projects that had been done with orchestras. And and realised there was one glaring thing that was that was, so, that was staring us in the face, and it, and, and and that once you found this thing, you realised there was a way, in, in fact, to do it. Quite simply, what had happened for years with people who'd done projects with orchestras, there was the band music, and then there were orchestral arrangements done around the band music. It just bolted on, wasn't it? It was yeah. band, orchestra. Yeah. So. The most logical thing was, don't think of it as band and orchestra. Think of it as one. The band is part of an orchestra. Yeah. You're writing for violin, strings, guitar, bass, drums, trumpets. Uh, so you're writing as, as one. Then you're not overlapping, copying. You actually are making a giant orchestra with these, yeah. with these instruments in it. And the, mo and the moment David and Misham and I realised this, we realised that there was a way actually you could, you could actually... Um, Stop it being, there's the band, there's the orchestra, there's the band, there's the, there they are sort of mismatching together. They, suddenly it all made an awful lot of yeah. sense. And, uh, and that's really, the, I suppose, the principle that we used. And uh, you know, it, 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 it does work. If, if everybody wants to make it work, it'll, it'll work. I was also at that great advantage at that time because I was selling a lot of records Everything was going good, so nobody would argue with you. If you hold the, if you hold the cards, you can, you can you can run the school. So the King Arthur show though was the last of the real big spectaculars for you, mm. wasn't it? I mean, yeah. you scaled like things down. Um, the next few albums, you went back to yes, at the tail end of '76, but you still yeah. continued bringing out solo albums. There was yeah. uh, No Earthly Connection, Criminal Record, Rhapsodies, things yes. like that. Um, Again, in 19, I think it was 1981, the... 1984 album. Yeah, that, that was going to be another big spectacular, but it didn't yeah. quite make it, did no, it? No, it didn't. And yeah. yet, there, I believe there's some footage of you on tour on there that could possibly end up in this. Yeah, there's some footage about... 1984 was... Uh, it came about through the late Tony Stratton Smith. I was just so fed up with the music. I mean, and prog rock was the biggest dirty word then. You know, anything yeah. like that. It was just, it was just, and I was just tearing my hair out. And I got a call from Tony Stratton Smith, who ran Charisma Band, a lovely guy. And I, I, and uh, and uh, Tony, I, I'd known Tony because uh, he used to have well, a lot of horses, and I had, I had a couple of race horses, <laughs> jumpers. And he called and said, "Come and see me. Come and see me in Wardour Street." And I said, "He said, do you want to make an album?" And I said, uh, what sort of album? He said, big one, orchestra, choir, the awful bit. And I said, but Tony, that's, you know, nobody wants it. He said, you know, no, no, no record cover. He said, I want one. He said, I think it'd be really good. And I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I can't. He said, I just, I don't want to conform. I said, I want people to do what they're good <clears> at doing. <throat> he said, uh, and I think you should do another big part. And I said, OK. He said, let's try and take it one stage further, though. I said, all right. And my manager at that time was MAM, which was Gordon Mills, who they looked after um, Tom Jones and all those sort of yeah. big, big, big agency. And a guy called Tony McCarthy, we called the general, who looked after me. I went to see him and he said, he said, what about a musical, rock musical? And I said, that's good. I said, but I have no idea how to write a libretto for a rock musical. Mm -hmm. I said, but I know a man who does. And I phoned up Tim Rice, as yeah. a crewmate, and Tim said, lovely idea, would you want to do it? And I said, 1984, the George Orwell. He said, fantastic. 
So we got together and went spent a lot of time down his house in Oxford and we wrote 1984. And everything was going swimmingly well. And we were working on the old principle of the of uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Tim Rice thing, which is you release the music before the musical appears. Um, and they've always done this. And they've always done it as well. A lot of the original soundtracks didn't have uh, the same artists in the musicals no. either. And that was also very common. Uh, and that was the way we worked it. And we'd, we, we wrote the music, recorded it. I, we got Shaka Khan over and uh, Steve Harley and all sorts of people. And we were really pleased with it. And then it all fell apart because out of the blue came an, um, came an American lawyer uh, in Chicago who handled the Orwell estate. Mm -hmm. And they were doing a deal with a film company who were involved with another record company. Um, and I think the film was Richard Burton or whatever. Right. It was a yeah. dreadful film. It was absolutely... Yeah. It was a, and I'm a huge Burt fan. This was an absolute disgrace what they did with the whole thing. And they just shoved a load of pop records on it. And they didn't want anything coming out that would conflict, uh, with, conflict that, yeah. with it. Okay. And we said, hold on a minute, this is, this is all new music. We're not sticking a load of pop records on some poxy film. Yeah. And no way. Absolutely no way. And they basically injuncted everything. Now that absolutely threw us. Because MAM were going to put up all the money for the, you know, for the stage show. Tim is a past master at putting on, yeah. you know, musical. And uh, we just threw our head in our hands. And the various lawyers for MAM tried everything for about a year and got nowhere. Um, and the album had come out, it had done all right. It got about 22 or something in the UK yeah. or something like that, and it had decent launch. Um, it was never released in America. Um, it was only released in a few other countries because shortly after that, uh, Tony Stratton Smith um, sold the label to Virgin and basically Tim who's a great great friend of mine we, we, Tim said we're, we're chasing a lost cause here yeah we're just chasing a complete lost cause and uh, so that was it I mean the idea was a great one and I still think the idea was a great one I mean I, I, I've still somewhere got all of Tim's full libretto and, and ideas for staging, which were absolutely brilliant. It would have been, well, the, the, it would have been way ahead of its time if it had come the out. The funny thing about that is I saw the tour and mm. obviously I didn't know that, uh, that what had gone on before that. Yeah. And I, I thought at the time, I thought, this is like a musical. Yeah. So that obviously fits in. But yeah. I thought the performance was really good, even though it was like obviously a condensed and yeah. scaled down thing. But I mean, if, if the footage that, that is supposed to be coming out mm. comes out, I think people will be very surprised. Yeah. I remember you telling me there was a very interesting story about the young lady who sang backing vocals on that tour and the road crew. Ah, it was, actually the, it was actually the lead, lead vocalist, <laughs> a young lady called Corrie Josias. Yes. Who, Corrie had, this was in South America, she'd actually upset the crew a little bit, bless her. Yeah. Or the crew, and that's one of the, something along the line. And uh, she, we used to have, she used to sing on a high, high plinth, and there was mesh, mesh at the bottom. There was, they used to put <laughs> dry ice going up so she would yeah. disappear in all the dry ice and things like that, and smoke and colour smoke. It used to look fantastic. And, um, and she'd upset one of them, or something, something had happened, I don't know quite what it was. And she got up there to do it, she started singing, I think it was Robot Man, and they changed all the tubing from that to, <laughs> to, uh, to blowing air, basically, mm. and they did a Marilyn Monroe on it. Oh dear. Um, which, um, yeah, it was very, very interesting. I mean, because I was, I was below her, and... Uh, I um, believe she'd forgotten to adjust her... Yeah, uh, she hadn't adjusted yes. everything, and, um, and I, I actually always thought she was a natural blonde, but... Um, and apparently you know, not. Apparently not. So just in case you're wondering if this does come out, this, <laughs> you won't see this footage. <laughs> the footage that may be coming out comes from England, sadly. Although yeah. I'm sure someone somewhere yeah, I'm, possibly I, I, has. I'm sure I don't. But, it, <laughs> but it, was, it was not a happy tour. I have to... Uh, the UK section was great. Yeah. Um, the UTEC, UK section was great. But by the time we went out to other, other countries, um, there were lots of problems within the band. Basically, we were out there, what well, was meant to be promoting um, a stage musical that was never going to happen. Right. And it just all seemed uh, 
I also, I mean, I enjoyed the English leg. That was great fun. And uh, some of the, the, the South American shows were really, really good too. But it all seemed to me pointless. You know, would I have done this had it not going to be for a musical? Yeah. And uh, you know, in fact, I saw Tim not that long ago and we brought it up again. Because he, he, he actually has gone down in record, which I think is really quite nice, as saying that Julia is the, is the um, best lyrics he ever wrote. It's a lovely song. So the best lyrics yeah, he ever wrote. It is a lovely song. He wrote, some, he wrote some super lyrics for that whole thing. But, you know, it's a, that's, another, that's another thing that's locked in the time warp. You know, who knows, maybe somebody 100 years' time when that American lawyer is dead and it's all in the public, <laughs> public domain, you know, somebody might actually grab it and turn it into a musical, you never know. There's, there's another potential inclusion uh, in the video vault from a year before, from Sweden. And I think you were invited <laughs> to play at the 300th birthday, birthday of a particular town in Sweden. Oh, that's had a, right. That, the that's outfit right. you had on, um, actually, <laughs> I think it was from the Rhapsodies. Uh, if I was to say yeah. it was built for speed rather than comfort, would I, I be correct? Yeah. You could certainly tell which way you dressed in those days. It was a rather tight number, if I remember rightly. Yeah. Not that that interested me in any way, it's a, but uh, it, it was, was an interesting combo. Was, it, was, it was an all-in-one... All in one, Powder blue. Yes, all-in-one. That's right. I had a few of them made. Um, um, and you're quite right, they were a little tight. Just a little. Uh, um, if, incredibly <laughs> tight. In fact, I used to have to be virtually sort of greased into them. Um, and that was an act that wasn't deliberate. Um, um, I just screwed up the sizes when I had them. When I had them made, I had about six of them made, and I screwed up the size. I've still got them somewhere. I do believe there were a lot of people actually impressed by your ability, and your, your musicality <laughs> came came quite high as well. I believe. Yeah, but, uh, it was. Uh, it was. It was. They were bloody uncomfortable to wear. <laughs> but I was just determined. I almost to get felt it. uncomfortable watching it. I have to say, I've seen yeah. it. And I thought. Well, if I had had them for sex a few years there. later and kept wearing them, it would have done it for me. <laughs> they were tight. Yeah, it, the, Sweden was a great place to go and play. It was a. It, it seemed that England. There was a certain period of time where England seemed to be the only country that was, that when it had, had sort of uh, moving on to a new genre of music instead of the music that was still around putting on the shelf so everybody could still still see it yeah. put it in a cupboard well it, it's we, called we it's called it. throwing the baby out with the bathwater yeah, we, we did this very good at when you go to other countries and a music you know you go and it when something was reached its you know perhaps its peak it wasn't slung away it was on the shelf there so you could see it you know, yeah. it might not be the most popular brand anymore but it's there for you to see what do we do in the, in the UK? We put it in a cupboard and shut the door. Yeah, you've got to hide it. And it just, I've <laughs> never understood this stupid mentality. I, I mean, the, the, the tragedy is, is that um, Britain literally did, for quite a few years, lead the world musically. Yeah, oh, yeah. The tragedy is that now it thinks it does. Yes. But it no, doesn't. No. Not even close to it. I, I go all around the world and I go and listen to bands and, uh, and and a lot of young bands and things go, and in general, they are light years ahead of what we've got. Yeah. I mean, we've got some great bands like Muse, you know, Fairy Animals, a great air I like. There's a lot of really good bands about, mm -hmm. and some, and also there's some, some people who are doing some great experimentation. Mars Volta, the classic example. But so there's still some good stuff, and people come through. But in general, there's so much good stuff from other countries. I mean, the Swedish show was interesting from an, from, for me for a number of reasons. First of all, the set seemed to be, uh, there seemed to be a lot of medleys in there for some reason. Yeah. I mean, why was that? Because it, it, it seemed oh. like another medley and we're going to play it and there's another medley from here and here. It was a strange set, unless, of course, obviously that was, you'd had the direction from the TV company, perhaps. Um, I, hand on heart, I honestly can't remember, but it was, um, it, it, it was quite a common thing then to do medleys back then of, of uh, especially if you had one or two songs that perhaps wouldn't stand up to a full-blown yeah. treatment you could actually put a small chunk of it within a whole yeah you know within a whole medley and and a two-minute section of that would be great you couldn't probably do a five or six minute song of it because no. it just wouldn't stand up on stage because some songs which work great on, on vinyl or on record, they don't work on, on stage. So 
I, I did that quite a lot. You think, well, that, those are good sections. I can use those. And they're really, really nice. Yes, did that a lot too. Let's have a look a little further back again. We've, we've headed into the 80s, but let's go back to the, the 70s again. Um, post King Arthur, yeah. the money ran out. You had to condense the band, <sighs> yeah. cut down the production. Um, the album No Earthly Connection, I can remember that. Uh, there was going to be, there was talk of that being a double album at the time, which yeah. again would probably tie in very nicely with the kind of stuff you were doing. The record company said, hang on. Yeah. Let's, uh, doing the totting up is we haven't got the money that's right that must have been pretty tough for you because i mean artists when you're being a creative artist the last thing you need to be told is the clock's running and that the bank is the yeah. clock in the money up. well i had a huge entourage at the time after king arthur i mean a massive amount of people on the payroll i mean it was ridiculous I mean, when, if I said it was three, at least three figures on the payroll. Well, the, the King Arthur, I think, show, there was 130, I think I've read, 133 people. That yeah. Put, uh, the production and the production, behind yeah. the scenes. Behind the scenes, yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a lot of people on a permanent payroll. Um, it, was, it was a lot of money just disappearing, just vanishing really, really quickly. And... Uh, even though there was money coming in from King Arthur, you know it was it was going out just as fast as it was coming in, and uh, it came to do the next album. Uh, and the re I went to them and I said I want to do you know another orchestral. You know this is what I do. Yeah. And they said no. And that's really they said band album. You need to just do a band album. And I said well I, I don't really want to do a band album. I, I, this is not what I do. You know. Uh, and they said well, what are we going to do? And uh, and I was under a, a contract with financially that uh, five albums that the advances were small. I actually I had actually spent about a, a year anyway working on on uh, No Earthly Connection, and they didn't get it. It was really funny. Nobody got it. What it was meant to be about. It was a story. It was a fantasy story, of of basically music being the missing sense. That was in all of us, um, and, and a bit like in the film uh, Two Thousand: The Space Odyssey. When 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 you died, it moved into the next person, and if right. it was used, it wasn't, and if it didn't, it came back. So it was a it was a life cycle. Now, you know, Mr. Hard Drinking, Dark Playing, Lunatic, Waking. That the press didn't get it at all. Uh, hold on, he's cracked. He's gone. You yeah. know, they didn't get it. And uh, we went out and toured it. It's it's very weird because it's one of those albums that. Um, it, it, it's my, it, it's the album that a lot of people really, really like. The, the strange thing was when we, we toured it, it sold pretty well. Uh, it sold four million copies. But I remember the record company calling an emergency meeting with my management because it had only sold four million copies and they were really concerned about sales. You know, when, when a failure comes in at four million copies, that's not a bad failure to my I know, mind. I know, I'd, know. I'd, I'd, I'd like a few failures now, <laughs> actually, it'd be really quite nice. Uh, but it was very it was very bizarre. We went out and toured it, and it was an amazing tour. I, I had a seven-piece or eight-piece band, and uh, it was a good band too. And it, it was a hard-drinking, hard-rocking, an amazing band. I, I, I tell you how hard-drinking and things it was. We got through six tour managers uh, because it was a 24-hour job and they used to do it. The only way that the management could get people to do it was they would do two-week shifts, shifts and then be paid <laughs> to go away to convalesce yes. for two weeks after. Um, so in effect, you, you re really... People talk about Led Zeppelin and The Who. Working for Rick Wakeman, did we were known, a note from your doctor? We were, yeah, we were known as the... <laughs> by any band, all of the bands, we, the... the English Rock Ensemble, were known as the hardest drinking, partying band of any band on the road. Do you, do you think that, I mean, if we get back to the music and the, the footage that, that we have, mm. will certainly show people just how good this band was. Because was I think sometimes, band. because of all the production and the orchestras, the choirs, people forget how good a band that was. Yeah. And, you know, t people like Tony Fernandez and, and the, the people who were in the band at the time, they weren't big names because no. people coming out of Yes, people expected you to be in some sort of super group, mm. and you you basically played 
to, to the, the musicians' best points, you got great musicians in rather than a, a name, which is, is to be credited. You could be credited. Well, for one of the things that I always wanted, I mean, yeah, I know people come to see whoever, whatever, but I wanted them to come and see the event. It's like I never hear people say, Oh, I came to see you perform Journey to the Centre of the Earth. Right. They'll say, Oh, we saw Journey to the Centre of the Earth. They won't say, oh, we saw you when you did your performance, Rick Wayne was King Arthur. They go, saw Arthur on ice. Yeah. You know, it was the ev event, the musical yeah. event that became. And I had another job convincing the record company not to use named people. But at the time, some of the, and I, I won't mention them, but they, they said, oh, we've got some people on our label. This, this bass player, he'd be really good, for, he'd yeah. be great for, and he's really keen to do it. And this guitarist, and I said, they're not good enough. I said, what do you mean? They're drawing people then. I said, I couldn't give a toss. They can't play what I want them to play. They're good at what they do, but technically they could not play what I want them to play. Well, I can remember a thing in, in one of the <coughs> national papers that Rick Waitman skews the big superstar tradition and plays with guys he plays with down at the pub. Yeah. And that, I thought, well, yeah, but these are the guys who probably really want to play the music rather mm. than someone who's counting the money. Yeah. I, rem know? I remember what, the very first concert that these guys did for me, or some of the guys, um, which was Roger Newell and Ashley, who were the, the only two that were there at the time. We did uh, a journey to the centre of the earth at the Royal Festival Hall, and it was their f first major gig, you know, outside of um, the Swan in Wickham and a few other, you know, <laughs> a, and a few other, and that's not the theatre, that's the pub. <laughs> and Brian Lane, the manager, came into my dressing room, and he said, I. I think you need to go and have a word with the guys in the band. He said, this is a massive step for them. He said, they're at Festival Hall tonight. You know? yeah. He said, it's star-studded out there, all these people. He said, they are going to be shitting themselves. He said, they need some reassurance <laughs> from you. <laughs> and I think so. He said, yeah. He said, they're going to be so nervous and tensed. And I said, <sighs> he said, this is where it all goes wrong, Rick. So I went along to the room where all the guys were, opened the door, and they're playing darts. They've got a pinball machine in there. <laughs> so they're all playing darts, and they've got the pipes and the arrows going. And I said, right, guys, there's um, nothing nothing to be worried about, be nervous about. And I actually just turned around, who's fucking worried? I just carried on playing. <laughs> and, uh, and I came out, and Brian said, well, I said, I think they're all right. You know? <laughs> You know, it's, it's, uh, it was very funny. I guess at the end of the day, I mean, you know, another gig is another gig. Um, and if you can play in a pub, you can play the big gigs. It's harder if you play in the big gigs and then yeah, have to play, play in the, the pub. pub. I th well, I think, I, think, I think you summed up the first thing, is if you can play. These guys were good. They knew they yeah. were good. You know, they were used for a lot of people. They were used for a lot of sessions and other. But these guys knew they were good. They, they'd, uh, they were good players. They were just really, really good players. But they... Um, for whatever reason, they hadn't um, had any, shall we say, solo success or success, yeah. which would put their own names up, Absolutely. you know, up front. Yeah. That was the only different. That's a, and I tell you, it's no different today. There's some mm -hmm. fantastic players around that the general public have never heard of. They're really good, and, they're in a, and most of them appear in the same bands when a lot of the bands are going out today, and they have now numerous musicians behind them, you know, go. It's mostly the same guys. Your current bass player is playing for Take That. I know, I know. <laughs> Lee probably was out with Take That. So I thought it was really, really funny. Uh, but he's having a whale of a time. Yeah, I'm sure he is. He knows he's having a whale of a time. I mean, my son Adam, he's one minute he's with, you know, with Black Sabbath, the next minute he's with Travis. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I don't know. That's how it works these days. I, I mean, I think the thing that a lot of people <coughs> will take from this, I mean, as I said, it, it's for the fans. I mean, it's, mm. it's, it's a cliche sometimes when people say, it's for the fans. I mean, half oh, the but time it, it is. isn't. It but is. this is, it's because I think a lot of this has, has been brought about by the fans, as we've already discussed. Well, you wouldn't be here without them. Um, and it's the, because they're the people that stayed with you when nobody else gave a toss. Yeah. When the record companies gave up on bands, when they stopped, you know, with, when they stopped with bands and people and... and and basically discarded them. It's it's like the, the old classic rock society of Martin Hudson up in up in Rotherham. When they started the classic rock society, it was probably when rock music was at its lowest ebb. Yeah. You know when you when you you know you, you wouldn't even you know, especially prog rock. You know it was just un, unheard. But there were some people who said no 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 we're not going to be told what to listen no. to. We're going to and and 
And those hardcore fans, they, it is, it's, it's phenomenal encouragement. It, it is, because sometimes you do actually feel, you know, I'll be a liar, I don't think there's any rock and roll that hasn't felt at some juncture, I don't know why I bother. This is just a, <laughs> just a complete, I, I'm wasting my time. I'm crap at what I do. I shouldn't do it. I must be crap because it's and nobody not nobody likes me. Oh, yeah. We all go through <laughs> it. We all go through it. And then some, something can happen, a letter, phone call, something, yeah. and that, and from somebody who cares. And you go, shit, no, I'll, I'll steam on here. So I think every rock and roller who's playing today, you know, somewhere along the line, is, you know, his, his career and life's been saved by some, some fans. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the thing about this package is as well, there's even some footage on there that surprised you. Yes, there are. There's thing. some footage that surprised me. You know, <laughs> luckily, there's, there's, I'm still waiting for some footage to appear that's going to surprise the news of the world, which hopefully won't happen. Uh, I'll have a little like word with Mr. Speak Rayleigh. To me later. Yeah, I'll have a little word I'm about sure that. Come to an <laughs> the, but yeah, there's always things you go, oh my God, I remember that. I wish you hadn't, and, and vice versa. But know. ultimately, you say, I wish you hadn't. But then again, it's one of those things, it's like you can't take your eyes. Actually, Maybe I wish you hadn't, but it's actually quite good. Well, there's always <laughs> memories that come back. You know, there's, there's the, uh, I think there's some little clips from a, a little night music, which the BBC did way back in, in, I cry, 82, 83. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was, I remember that because my great friend Robert Powell came along to narrate Grey's Elegy, and he'd just lost his father, mm -hmm. literally that week, um, to cancer. It's a tough call for that. I can't uh, do something like that. And, what was interesting for for Robert to read uh, over music that particular piece of work, you yeah. know, Grey's Elegy in a Country Churchyard. Yeah, I mean, it was just, just uh, I've never really talked to him about it as to what must have been going through his mind when he, you know, when he did it, and and it's really funny how certain things will just have a, a like a, a knee jerk reaction as to what. It, what you remember yeah. it for, you know. Well, the, the, the box is out now, as people will be mm. watching this. Mm. As ever, Rick, it's a great pleasure to talk to you. What can I say? Uh, so you're a gentleman uh, and a scholar. <laughs> and, uh, well, maybe in a few months' time we'll be looking at some more, maybe volume two. Who else, who else knows what's out there? Have to check out news at ten. <laughs> Cheers, Rick. Thank you, sir. Bye. <laughs>